challenging work that we have around um, climate solutions. So I wanted to be sure everyone here is aware that the college itself is doing some things too. We're not just asking everyone else to go out into the world. Um, we have a climate action plan that we published our, our second iteration last year, and we are seeking um, a 50% reduction in our institutional greenhouse gas emissions compared to 2008 levels um, by 2026. So in a few moments here, once we get going, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat so that if you wanna learn more about the Climate Action Plan, you can link to that website and do so. Um, what else? Gratitude is the main thing. We have those organizers on this call know we've been working on this for, for many, many months. There have been some sort of organizational delays and um, different things, but we're so happy to have scheduled this and have everyone here today. Um, specifically, I need to give thanks to Davidson Generations for Action. They are also known as Gen Act, and you will, in your follow-up email, receive more information um, with their website and ways you can get involved with them, but they are a group of um, alumni who are working on climate change, among other important uh, global issues, and they first brought the idea of such a series, um, and particularly having Dr. Xu as a keynote speaker and, and made that introduction. So thank you all to um, not only your role in this event, but, but your work in the world. Um, that really means a lot. Um, Judith Rowles, who you see furiously kind of multitasking here, is my colleague in the Office for Alumni and Family Engagement, and she it has been the sort of technical mastermind and really helped me, who is intimidated by events, to sort of um, run this thing in what we hope will be a, a rather smooth manner. So thank you to Judith and your team. And um, my colleague Cameron Clark is in Hans Auditorium in Chambers with a group of some students and others who wanted to join in person. Um, so thanks to Cameron for all of his support with the series. And um, to our speakers, of course, they always love to engage and, and give back. Despite the great work they're doing in the world, they, they know the importance of mentoring young folks um, and following in their footsteps. Um, so thank you to you, Camila, and you, Henry. Um, finally, we do have some donors who help to make, you know, events like this possible. And so you, if you would be interested in joining that list, um, I can also drop in the chat an opportunity to do that. Um, really, you know, grateful to those primarily alumni and, and friends of Davidson who make these sorts of things possible for our community. And let's see. <clears throat> also wanted to share that there will be some ongoing opportunities for students, as we said, for alumni, with the alumni group, for faculty and staff to continue to engage in different ways, because we do feel that, um, you know, climate work, like so many things, is best done in partnership with others. It can be very isolating to do alone. So we're excited to hopefully start something here that will carry forward. And again, we'll follow up over email with some ways to do that. Um, moving into Zoom keeping, hopefully, you know, most are familiar with Zoom, but but hopefully some helpful remarks in case you aren't. This session will be recorded. Um, a number of folks weren't able to make this particular time, but they're excited to, to view the speakers. And so uh, please be aware that it will be sent out to those who registered and those internal to the community who want a copy. Um, it will take us about two weeks, so you know, to get that out because we like to um, transcribe and do some editing and things. So, so be on the lookout for that email. Um, please, it looks like everyone's doing a great job staying muted, but that mute button is on your bottom bar where the microphone is. Click that so it has a red line through it, please, so that we can reduce our background noise. Um, we will be using, many of you have your cameras on, that's excellent. The speakers will just be, you know, holding a dialogue here and love to see your faces. They will be taking questions throughout the event. We're not going to save questions to the end. So that brings us to that chat feature, the little, um, you know, dialogue bubble there at the bottom banner. And so you can um, click on chat and type your question right in there. Um, and the moderator will be sort of working through those as they come in and we'll, we'll do our best to get to most, if not all of those questions. When you're working with Zoom, you have the option of two different views, a gallery view and a speaker view. And so for me, this is up in the right hand corner. If I go up top, I have a view option and I can click back and forth between those two. Um, we recommend the speaker view for the best experience here so that our speakers are, are largest on your screen and you have the best um, kind of engagement with them. 
And, um, <clears throat> you know, when we think about the chat, today's presentation is intended to both you know, prompt our thinking around climate issues and also challenge things that that we may be thinking in a diverse room here. So we do hope that any questions or comments you share in the chat will be um, in the spirit of um, collegiality and, and open dialogue and exploration. And finally, we have live transcripts um, enabled if, if that's a service that's valuable to you. So you can hover over the live transcript um, pop up there on your screen, that button, and you'll see subtitles as we, um, as we move through the conversation. So any questions or tech concerns, our fearless Judith Rouse waving her hand there, who I mentioned, you can you can private chat her uh, by going into the chat and selecting her name, and she can help you out with that. Um, and with that, I want to pass things over to Dane Erickson, who's a, an alum um, and one of the members of Gen Act that I mentioned. Dane is from the class of 2001. He's led a high impact, diverse career to date. He just said he's still looking for what he's going to be when he grows up. My favorite tagline on his very diverse and impactful bio, though, was that he took an international family sabbatical in which the family went around the world to volunteer, write, um, and give his children the opportunity of a lifetime. So may we all be so lucky and intentional with our own choices. And um, Dane, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Yancey, and welcome, everyone. Um, so my task is to quickly introduce Gen Act, who we are, what we do, and then our two amazing speakers. Um, so Gen Act started um, through collaboration between the class of 1964 and a couple of members from 2001 and 2003. And um, we both kind of came to the conclusion that there's this incredible network of alumni um, and that one through inter intergenerational contact, we could learn from each other um, at every phase in life and we could take action on behalf of our future generations, be that our children, grandchildren or great grandchildren. So we're an informal group um, network. Um, our website is just live. We came together last year davidsongenerations.org. I think my friend and colleague Andy Lanaha just put the um, link in the Zoom. So we welcome everyone to join us. It's free to join. Uh, just put your name and email address in there and come co-create interesting work with us. This is our first um, uh, activity and event. And um, uh, I'll just quickly, if you look on our website, um, you can see that we have basically five big pillars. We're multi-generational effort working on behalf of future generations. Um, we really encourage alumni to, live, to lead lives of, of leadership and service at all stages in life. And we focus on the long life after Davidson. We embrace the honor code in public and private life. And then we want to take action, as I mentioned. Um, so we have a couple key initiatives. One is around climate. Uh, another is around racial justice. Another is around democracy. Um, so anyway, keep, come join and, and uh, participate with us. Okay, uh, the, oh, the only other thing I would mention I've been asked to, to say is that we have no political or other agenda about the future of the college. Uh, we just wanna partner with the college to do, to do good work and to um, help people connect um, um, across generations. So um, yeah, and the only other thing I'll mention is that um, I've been asked to give this quick intro, um, but there's a number of people on our team that are really the energy and the brains behind it including Phil Lewis from the um, class of 64. Charlie Rowe, thank you so much for everything you've done to get us here, 64. Jerry Hopkins, of course, 64. Um, Beth Helfrich, uh, 2003, and uh, the venerable uh, Andy Lanaha from 2001. Okay, so now let's uh, just introduce our two amazing speakers. Um, so Camila Domanowski is from the class of 2012. Uh, she's a business reporter for NPR. She covers cars and energy including how automakers and oil companies are responding to pressure to slash carbon emissions. Um, she's from the class of 2012, as I mentioned, and she's living proof uh, that you can be an English major from a liberal arts college and have a slam dunk career. So um, don't forget to tell your kids that or uh, tell your parents that depending on what stage of life you're in. Um, and in a career highlight, she once helped NPR win a pie eating contest. So uh, grab her on LinkedIn and get that story later. Um, Henry Shu uh, is a senior research fellow at the Center for International Studies at Oxford and a professor, a professor emeritus of international relations um, from Oxford as well. 
At Davidson, he was student body president from 1960 to 61. He went on to study at Merton College at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and then earned his PhD in political philosophy from Princeton. Um, he also uh, held important teaching positions at the University of Maryland and Cornell. And at Cornell, he began studying the ethical and political issues raised by climate change back in the early 90s. And during the last three decades, he's become one of the most influential authorities on climate change and climate justice in the field of international relations. Uh, his first two decades of writings were published as a book in 2014 as Climate Justice, Vulnerability and Protection. And then his most recent book, which is what I think we'll focus a lot on today, The Pivotal Generation, which is, resonates with our group, Why We Have a Moral Responsibility to Slow Climate Change Right Now was published last year. And it's been described by as many things, but including a very important book on the most urgent problem of our times. So with that, I hand it over to Camila and to Henry. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dane. Thank you, Nancy, for the introductions. Thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us here today. Um, and my role here is really to be a moderator, to be throwing questions to Henry. So I could ask Henry questions uh, for, for days, I think it's fair to say, but I want to be sure to channel your questions to him. So please do use the chat function um, and throw whatever questions uh, you want to toss at Henry in there. But I want to start, Henry, uh, in kind of a funny way. I'm a journalist. You're a philosopher. So let's start, obviously, by talking about science, right? Uh, any conversation about climate change has to start with our scientific understanding of the situation that the planet is in. So I wanted to throw at you a couple of really foundational principles that I think people will need to understand your work. Can you start by explaining what a carbon budget is? Okay. Thanks, Cleola. Let me first say what a delight it is to be in touch with uh, a large group of Davidsonians, which I hope may include some other uh, gray and wrinkled survivors of the class of 1961, which of course was the most distinguished class in the history of the college. Um, right, carbon budget. The driver of climate change is the cumulative atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. You, it's important to emphasize cumulative because the crucial greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, which stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. It doesn't all stay uh, for the same amount of time, but much of the carbon dioxide stays for tens and even hundreds of thousands of years. So as we emit greenhouse gases, they basically just get added to what's there already. So that's the, the cumulative total. And the cumulative total is the driver of climate change. So one way to think of this is through this concept of a carbon budget. For any given probability of any a given amount of temperature rise, there's a cumulative total of atmospheric gas. So if you increase the cumulative total of greenhouse gas, then you increase the likely temperature. And uh, so you can say, we'd like the temperature not to go up more than X degrees. Well, then that means the cumulative total mustn't pass X uh, amount of greenhouse gas. Right, so say 1.5 degrees might be something that the world might decide on right. as a target, hypothetically. Um, so obviously that's what the target that the world set sort of aspirationally in the Paris Agreement two degrees being a fallback position, both of those looking extraordinarily difficult for the world to actually manage to hit based on our current trajectory. I, I wanted to ask you about another central scientific metaphor to our understanding of climate change. One's the idea of a budget that we have spent almost all of. The other is this idea of a, of a tipping point. 
what's a tipping point and, and why is it so crucial to your understanding of, of the urgency to act on climate change? That's really, um, really crucial. I, I was saying that as the atmospheric total increases, the temperature increases, that sounds very linear, but in fact, things are not linear. There are thresholds. And so at certain points, uh, there's a radical change. Uh, and that's what we call a tipping point. So strictly speaking, a tipping point is a threshold beyond which a change becomes self-perpetuating. It's the self-perpetuating that's really scary. That is, we really lose control of it. So we, we do say that climate change is anthropogenic in the sense that people are causing it. And that's true, but it's also true that some of the responses are responses that result in self-perpetuating change. Um, probably help if I gave an example. The, uh, the melting of the Greenland ice is, is a good example of a tipping point. The, the, the ice in Greenland is two miles thick. So the top of the ice is high enough that the air is really quite cool. But as the climate changes, there's some melting even up at the top not just on the edges down at the sea. And so gradually the top of the ice in Greenland is going to sink lower. And as it sinks lower, it'll encounter warmer temperatures, temperatures that are warmer than the temperature two miles high. And if this goes on long enough, this will become self-perpetuating. That is, as there's melting, the depth of the ice becomes less, that puts the ice in warmer air, that makes more ice melt, that brings the ice down lower and so on. And as far as we know, there's no way to stop that. So when the melting of Greenland reaches the point at which uh, this self-perpetuating cycle takes over, then we passed the tipping point. And unfortunately, there are a lot of tipping points out there. We don't know exactly where they are, but they're pretty close. One is for the, the Amazon rainforest and others are for various different ice sheets, including Greenland, but also uh, Antarctica. And so you were drawing the distinction between the, the anthropogenic component of climate change, what humans are directly causing, right? The idea that this is the thing that we are making happen, but that also there are elements of it that once we have started this process, nature itself is going to keep continuing and it's going to get, is it like, like keep pushing a boulder off the top of a mountain? You cause the beginning, but once it's started, you're not able to, to stop it? That's right. Or, you know, sitting at the top of a, of a slide in the playground, you inch forward, nothing happens, you inch forward again, nothing happens, you inch forward again, and you go down the slide. Um, except that with these um, tipping points, it would be as if when you got to the bottom of the slide, you bounce back up to the top and then came down again. I mean, it's uh, the, because of this self-perpetuating characteristic. Right. When you talk about the number of tipping points that we aren't entirely sure where they are, are they all in our future or are some of them in our past? Well, sadly, I we think some are in our, or I say we, the scientists think that at, at least the West Antarctic ice sheet probably is already melting irreversibly. It's, uh, it's very sad for me because when I, I began working on this in uh, 1990, no one had decided yet that our target should be to stay below 1.5 or below two degrees. What people were saying is, well, let's just be sure we don't pass any major tipping points like um, the collapse of the Amazon or the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet. But in uh, 
I think it's 2014, a couple of studies uh, to independent of each other came out and said that it does look as if the melting of the, of the Western Arctic ice sheet is now irreversible. And that's worth about seven feet of um, sea rise over the entire globe everywhere, all the oceans. Right. Which is a lot. In fact, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, website called Climate Central. You can, you can go to Climate Central, plug in the name of a city, like say Galveston, Texas, or Columbia, South Carolina, or Savannah, Georgia, and then plug in an amount of sea level rise and they'll um, generate a map showing how much of, let's say, Columbia, South Carolina is gonna be covered by water if there's say seven feet of sea level rise. And this is a very uh, gripping <laughs> experience uh, to do this for any city that you, you know anything about. Right, and that link has just been dropped in the chat. Um, and we have some resources that Henry will, has put together that will be sent out after the conversation as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question, you know, you mentioned that since you started working in this space, the understanding of climate change has grown more specific, more concrete on th things like whether we've passed this, this tipping point in Antarctica. Obviously, working with climate models involves uncertainty. There are ranges of outcomes. There are lots of things where scientists can predict, you know, it's approximately what's going to happen, but not precisely. How does that affect our understanding of our obligation, the, the moral responsibility to, to act on the future when certain knowledge about the future simply isn't available? Well, some things are quite clear. I mean, it's quite clear that we are causing climate change. There's uncertainty about very specific things like, have we really um, caused the West Antarctic ice sheet to mm -hmm. be melting irreversibly? It looks as if we have, with the Amazon forest, for example, I think it, it, the scientists themselves right now don't know. It, it appears we're quite close to the point at which the Amazon will start collapsing on its own, but we're not sure. Um, well, let me ask it a different way. Some, Does it matter if scientists can say with absolute certainty, do you need absolute certainty from scientists in order to say, well, the moral responsibility is, is to do, is to act now? Oh, I think not because um, although there might be some pleasant surprises, mo most of the surprises are gonna be very unpleasant and, uh, if anything, I think the uncertainty is a reason to act. It's certainly not a reason not to act. I mean, if you say, well, we're uncertain, let's wait and see what happens uh, and something really bad happens, uh, then there's nothing to do about it. So at worst, if you act now, you might say, spend a little money or, or uh, expend a little energy that you didn't really need to, um, but that would just mean uh, you know, you had overachieved, uh, but you wouldn't have done any damage if you just sit back, of course, you uh, let things get worse. And, and one of the key things, of course, is that business as usual, I, our just carrying on as we are now is making things worse. I mean, we're generating more greenhouse gas that makes the cumulative total in the atmosphere greater, that makes the temperature go up and and all these other phenomena that are part of climate change. So it, it's, it's not as if so-called waiting would actually mean not having any effect. Waiting to change the way we're living is choosing to make, uh, continue to make things worse. We have sort of decades of observing what that looks like, in fact. Mm. Right. In 1990, the big issue was, will there really be climate change? Is it really anthropogenic? I mean, you know, we weren't sure that fossil fuel accumulation in the atmosphere was causing climate change, although it looked like it was. Now that's quite clear. And we have other uncertainties. Um, 
but not that one anymore. Yeah, awesome. Um, I see some questions are starting to come in in the chat, and a, a lot of them are focusing on convincing skeptics or the questions of whether we have enough time to act on climate change. I want to get to both of those questions in a little bit, and please, everyone listening, do pop your questions into the chat. But before we get there, Henry, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the major theme of, of your book, The Pivotal Generation, which is about the uniqueness of the obligation of the current generation to act on climate change. And, you know, I'll, I, accepting the premise that we owe something to the future, I, I, I'll, I'll just sort of take that as a given. We owe to the future not to start a nuclear war, not to poison our rivers such that there's no clean drinking water. There's all kinds of things that we owe to the future if we believe that we owe them anything. Why would climate change be different? than any of these other obligations? It's because we're at such a, a crucial period in what's happening. We, we know that climate change will continue worsening as long as the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases keeps going up. What do you do to keep it from going up? You have to stop emitting greenhouse gas, that means basically you have to stop using fossil fuel. That means we need a, a real revolution in the global energy system. And if we don't do that very soon, uh, it's going to be a very long time before we stop emitting greenhouse gases and making the total go up. So Another of the um, terms that gets thrown around a lot now that we haven't talked about is net zero 2050. But one of the things the scientists think is we have to get our emissions of carbon dioxide down to zero in 2050. Well, the only way to do that is, is to radically reduce the amount of, of uh, fossil fuels we burn. That means we've got to make all sorts of radical changes like having electric cars rather than uh, combustion engines and so on. So that's one reason it's urgent. The second reason it's urgent is, is the tipping points that you were mentioning before. We, we're, we don't know exactly where the trigger, where the thresholds are, but we do know that they're out there because we understand why they will they will happen. I mean, we know what will cause the collapse of the Amazon. We know what will cause the permafrost in the uh, Arctic to melt. We're just not sure exactly when we're gonna get there, but we know it can't be very far away. So that's a second reason for urgency. And the third reason is something I hope we can talk about some more is that there really are people resisting climate action, namely fossil fuel interests. I, I realize this is a serious claim to make, and I'll be happy to try to, to back it up. But I think, I mean, people understand that for a long time, oil and gas companies said there was no climate change, so that they engaged in denial. Now they're saying, oh, yeah, there is climate change, and we're going to help you deal with it. But I think that's not true. I think they're trying to uh, trick us and that that's making things much more difficult. And uh, maybe that's something else we can talk about at some point. But but the the kind of main point here is not everybody's on the same side here. There are people who are digging in and trying to uh, to hang on to business as usual and prevent the uh, move away from fossil fuel. Yeah, I, I I am very excited to talk some more about the resistance. And as the title of this conversation, delay is the new denial. I think that digging into that is going to be really important for this conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that Gary Hammond threw into the chat, um, which is something that I know you have thought a lot about, which is carbon dioxide removal. Why do we need to act now? Why can't we expect that technology will get better and that future generations can just suck the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. 
carbon dioxide removal is terrifically important. So I, I thank him for that question. And we, we will surely have to remove some carbon dioxide because it's, it's perfectly clear that we can't stay within the carbon budget for either 1.5 or two. And so we're gonna have to uh, come back. So on the one hand, some carbon dioxide removal is a good thing. However, it's not the same as not emitting unless you're doing it simultaneously. That is, we could reduce our emissions by a certain amount right now, or if we had the technology, we could remove that much carbon dioxide right now. And it wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you refrain from putting out one more ton of carbon dioxide now, or you recover one ton now, but we haven't perfected these technologies yet, the technologies of carbon dioxide removal. So one problem is we may or may not perfect them, but, but the, the main thing I wanna emphasize right now is even if we do perfect them, it's gonna be later when we do the carbon dioxide removal and the carbon dioxide that we remove later will have been in the atmosphere for one decade, two decades, however long it is, and it will have been driving climate change while it was there. So if we're fortunate enough to develop good carbon dioxide removal technologies, we will be able to bring the concentration of carbon dioxide down, but we won't be able to wipe out the effects of having had all that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere during the years between when it was emitted and when we developed the capacity to remove it. So it's really important to understand both. We need the carbon dioxide removal, but carbon dioxide removal later is not as good as not emitting now. And it's also probably going to be much more expensive. I mean, right now, anyway, it's far more expensive. Um, I have an occupational hazard where I'm always trying to think of the metaphor that I would use to say something on the radio. And so I was thinking about you know, with a carbon budget, that idea suggests like, oh, well, you could borrow money now and pay it back later, right? But it breaks down with this with the climate situation because it's more like if you have a hole in your roof you could fix it now or you could fix it later but if you fix it later you're going to have had all the damage <laughs> from your exactly roof between now and then. absolutely beautifully put yeah that's exactly right you can clean it up later but you can't undo what it did while it was there right um i wanted to go back to a word that you said several times which was radical, the need for a radical overhaul of our energy system, which will require some radical change. There's been an interesting conversation in the chat um, about the question of whether we have to make concessions and give things up in order to fight climate change, or we have the technology to sort of have abundance and not need to make, not need to make sacrifices. I mean, I paraphrase, but I hope that's a fair paraphrase of, of what people were talking about in the chat. Um, I wanted to ask about the question of, of sacrifice. I think this is, you know, I was going back to the question of what we owe the future and we owe it to the future not to start a nuclear war, but I don't feel like I need to make a tremendous sacrifice in my life right now in order to achieve the world not starting a nuclear war. Whereas action on climate change, whether you conceive of it as something that individuals can respond to or that we globally need to respond to, a radical transformation of our energy system would be extremely disruptive. I mean, and this is this is perhaps one point on which you and the oil industry might be one of very few points on which you agree. We use a tremendous amount of oil and natural gas. If we want to take 100 years to shift away from oil and gas, we could do that quite painlessly, but we don't have 100 years. Will it be painful to take the kind of action that the, the urgency of, of the situation demands from us as a planet? 
Uh, it will, <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, we are going to have to make some sacrifices, particularly in the interim. That is, for example, now if you fly a lot, you're making a big contribution to causing climate change. Eventually, we can hope that we'll develop technologies that'll uh, allow us to power planes in a way that doesn't have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe they'll, you know, we'll be able to develop batteries light enough that uh, they can use electricity and not not have any greenhouse gas emissions at all. So, in the end, we may be able to go back to doing a lot of flying. But right now, uh, it would be much better if uh, if we didn't do nearly as much flying as as we're doing now. So there are a lot of cases in which after we've made the transition to new energy sources, we'll be able to go back to doing a lot of things that we would like to do. But right now, uh, we may have to, to give them up. Um, is this a reasonable request of us? What, one thing I think you can say is however painful or inconvenient it is for us to do what we knew we need to do to bring about the energy revolution, it's going to be a lot more painful and and threatening for future people if we don't get a lid on climate change. Because right now, there is no limit, you know, un until the concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere stops growing, climate change gets worse. So there's at the moment, there's no limit and there won't be a limit until we stop increasing that concentration. If we aren't willing to do what we need to do, then uh, we're gonna put uh, future people in far more, we're gonna cause them far more trouble and put them into far greater danger than we face. On the other side, by the way, I, I mean, there are all kinds of benefits to making this uh, transition. For example, the, there are literally hundreds of millions of people who die every year from the air pollution that comes from burning coal, for example. And just in general, our air can be made almost immeasurably better, uh, more healthful, clearer, than it is now once we get past uh, fossil fuels. So there are all kinds of, uh, of health benefits. And if you think in terms of national economies, the, the best possible thing would be to be the world leader of the new technologies. It's, you know, it's, um, if you hang on to fossil fuel, you're saddling yourself with a dying technology if you become a pioneer in solar, wind, and whatever else, fusion, uh, who knows. Um, you can be the country that has the technology of the future, and that's in economic terms enormously beneficial. So it's going to be inconvenient and troublesome for individuals to make the transition. It's the best possible thing that can happen to the national economy. And it's an extremely good thing uh, for health, uh, as well as putting a, a lid on the climate change. There's sort of two other ways that this generation is is unique. This generation, as you define it, being the people alive today, right? Just from what you were right. from what you were describing just now. One being the idea that people in the future will have would have a much more difficult challenge, right? That we have what seems hard to us today is actually much easier than what the challenge would be in the future, which is certainly something that I think some of us feel looking at the past, right? Like, oh, it would have been a much easier thing to tackle climate change if we had started as a planet doing it sooner than we did now. And we can sort of imagine future generations asking the same, the same thing of us. And the other one is the interesting 
difference about where, where the benefits are. You know, if we look at a past that had the tremendous benefits, the, the luxuries enjoyed from a fossil fuel powered economy and a future that might be able to take advantage of a green economy if the planet pulls off a transition. And we're sort of in a, a potentially painful middle of trying to execute a very high stakes, very rapid transition so that so that the future can actually be enjoyed by, by the next generation. Is that fair? Yeah. And in, in some ways, people my age are the worst of all because I, earlier people who were uh, say using uh, coal burning technology were causing climate change, but they didn't know it. My crowd is worse because we're also causing climate change, but we knew it and, uh, and we still didn't do anything about it. And yes, it would have been much easier if, uh, if we had started sooner, if we had, you know, the framework convention on climate change was adopted in 1992. Um, if, and world leaders pledged to get right to work on climate change, but uh, they didn't keep those promises. If they had, we could have made the transition that we now need to make really quickly. Uh, more slowly and, and, and more easily. You know, the, the sort of general thought is if you want to be to zero fossil fuel by 2050, you have to get half the way there by 2030. Because the, the second, eliminating the final half is going to be much harder than eliminating the first half. So if by 2030, we're not halfway there, it seems very unlikely you'll be all the way there by 2050. Uh, so 2030 is soon. It is. I was really glad to hear Yancey say that Davidson is talking about doing something by 2026. I mean, that's what we need. And one of the tricks going on now is lots of people are saying, oh, right, we'll be at zero by 2050. But for now, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. But if we keep doing the same thing now, we're not going to be at, at uh, zero by 2050. And what you really want to know from people is, what are you going to do the next two or three or five years? What are you going to do by 2030? Uh, because, you know, it's conceivable that you could do more than half between 2030 and 2050. But that would involve even more radical action. And if we're not willing to be as radical as we need to be now, it's hard to see why we're suddenly going to be willing to be even more radical in 2030, unless we're just scared to death, which yeah. might happen. Well, I also, I want to, I want to dig in on the we, um, which we've been <laughs> using as a bit of shorthand here. And, and we got a question in the chat about what are you doing to slow or stop the increase of coal plants in China, India, and Russia? And I think you could actually zoom out from that to ask a more fundamental question some people have, which is why should I strive to cut emissions, whether personally, as an organization, as a state, whatever metric you use, if I can't be sure that other people will? Mm. Uh, this is what some theorists call the arms dealers argument. Uh, if I don't sell arms, somebody else will sell arms. So I might as well sell arms. Um, if other people don't do what they should do, uh, it's going to be bad. But I don't think that's a reason we shouldn't do what we should do. And one way to try to get the other people to, to do what needs to be done is for them to see that we are doing it, to actually make the sacrifices. I think one of the mistakes the U.S. has made over these last 30 years that I've, I've been watching American policy is we've, we've really worried inordinately about being made a sucker. You know, there was, there was something called the Kyoto Protocol, which we don't really... Uh, have time to get into, but the U.S. wouldn't sign up to it. And the reason it wouldn't sign up to it was it said it doesn't obligate other people to do enough. So we're not going to do anything. 
because the other people are not going to do enough. And so nothing happened for about 25 years. Um, so waiting for the other people is the road to disaster. Going ahead and doing what needs to be done and setting a good example means A, you do what you should do, but B, you do set an example for them. And when you say to China, you're burning far too much coal and they are burning far too much coal, no, no doubt about it. But if you say that and you're not doing much, they'll just say, well, why don't you do something? So you'll have much more credibility uh, if, if you're doing a lot. But I don't want to understate uh, this problem. I mean, the, the biggest oil and gas companies in the world are state ones. Saudi Aramco, the oil company of Saudi Arabia, is the largest oil company in the world. And I have lots of complaints about Chevron and Exxon Mobil and so on. But the worst one, is Saudi Aramco and Saudi Aramco has actually said, we intend to be the last man standing because uh, we can extract the oil more cheaply uh, than anybody else. And so we're just gonna stay at it. Um, what can we do? We can, as I've said already, try to set a good example, but I think we may well have to use serious pressure like i don't know if this would work but in the case of saudi aramco we've sold them a lot of fighter planes we could say well if you want spare parts for your fighter planes let's see you uh cut back on your oil production i mean i think we're we're really going to have to play uh hardball on some of these things well, the Saudis are an interesting case because they also do think that they'll be able to make a lot of money off of solar power. Some of the major players in the oil industry do not seem to see a path to making money off of the uh, uh, transformation of the energy system at all. You, you wanted to talk about the resistance that companies are putting up, and I wanted to ask some more uh, of, about the, the nature of that resistance and why, why the why de delay is is the new denial? I'll just throw it to you very broadly like that. Okay, right. Well, I, I, I think a lot of oil companies, uh, I mean, this certainly includes Saudi Aramco and it includes the Russian gas company, Gazprom and, and uh, lots of other people besides our sort of uh, local villains like uh, Chevron and, and ExxonMobil, but a number of them, seem to have the strategy that somebody's going to have to cut back on production, but it's not going to be us. Um, there's a report, you you mentioned that I've sent some reading lists that uh, can be circulated afterwards. On, on one of them, I, I have uh, some detailed references for things I'm going to talk about now, but in um, December, the uh, Oversight Committee of the House of Representatives issued a report on uh, so-called greenwashing by American oil companies that is claiming to be taking action when they're not taking action. And they were able to get access to a lot of uh, internal documents from oil companies, which make quite clear that they don't have any intention of reducing production anytime soon and, and don't even have any intention of not drilling new oil and gas wells, which are, are the last thing uh, that we need. So, and it, one of the executives at Chevron even said, <laughs> we realize some of the companies are gonna be cutting back. That's gonna be good for us because we can move in there and take their markets. So. One, one source of, of, of information about what the, our companies are really planning is, is the, the report of the House Oversight Committee. There are a couple of other sources. There's a publication called The Production Gap, which is just a report every year on plans for additional oil production. People can, can Google that. And then there's an organization in London called Client Earth, which is a lot like the 
Southern Environmental uh, Law Center. And they have something called the greenwashing files. So if you Google climate earth greenwashing files, you can get those. And these, all three of these sources, the House Committee Report, the Production Gap, and the climate earth greenwashing files make clear that the companies are are planning um, more production, not not less production. They're, they're doing other things um, which are also uh, deceptive. I, I mentioned already, they say, sure, we're committed to uh, net zero by 2050, uh, but they're not reducing production now. So that's basically a meaningless pledge. And in many cases, they're simply shifting the production to less visible sources. Sorry, this takes a second to explain, but suppose that uh, Shell has 95% of its business in fossil fuel and it sells an oil field that's responsible for 5% to a private equity outfit, then Shell can say, well, we used to be 95% in fossil fuel. Now we're only 90% in fossil fuel. We've reduced by 5%, but the oil is still coming out of the ground. It's just being drilled and, and extracted by the private equity company that Shell sold the oil fields to. So this is just, um, a shell game in both senses and uh, and is basically trying to make it look as if people are doing something they're not doing. You One thing you can say for companies like Gazprom in Russia and Aramco is they don't really pretend they're trying to, to help you. You mentioned that, uh, that the Saudis are, are uh, building a lot of solar but they've actually said, we're gonna build a lot of solar because then we can sell more of our, our oil. So it's not so they can drill less, it's so they can export more. Um, and you know, the speaking of companies that are not greenwashing, the, the Shells and BPs of the world have targets that they say are aligned with net zero. And then as you, Bloomberg has done some great reporting on the sort of selling of assets off to to affiliated companies. Um, but here in the US, you know, the American Petroleum Institute just had its big state of the the state of the American energy system speech. Um, and they said that they expect oil demand to go up for the next three decades and that American companies should should drill to meet that demand. I mean, I think what oil companies would say is that they are drilling it because the world wants it because it will be used. Where does the moral culpability for these emissions land if the oil companies get it out of the ground, but it's us who drive bigger SUVs every year? Well, there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, there's my generation, my, my age group, um, for not doing anything. It's... Um, consumers who are not uh, making change. It's fossil fuel companies that are not making change. It's government, which isn't doing anything. I mean, uh, um, it, it's fairly clear that the fossil fuel, the fossil fuel companies could develop plans to make a rapid transition out of fossil fuel and turn themselves into energy companies, which is what they say they're doing, but they're not. And it's, it's what the Europeans they're say they're doing. The Shell and BP say that they're doing. Exxon has yeah, no intention of, of doing that's that. That's true. You're right. It's There is a difference here between the American companies and the European ones. Quite right. Um, where it's clear that the fossil fuel companies are not going to do this on their own, then somebody's going to have to make them do it. And this is what we have government for, right? I mean, self-regulation is better uh, if people will self-regulate and if they will uh, work out their own uh, energy revolution. But if they won't, this is why we have government. I mean, there's 
you know, there's the theoretical argument, which everybody learns in uh, Econ 101, that you can't expect the market to protect the environment because nobody owns the environment. And in the market, people try to advance the interests of their own property. So you need government to take care of public goods like protecting the environment. So, I mean, there's a perfect theoretical argument. And then there's also this practical argument that, w it, that if you look hard, you can see that the fossil fuel companies are not doing it. So government needs to take action. There's all kinds of stuff they need to do for a, a start governments need to stop subsidizing the extraction of fossil fuel. I mean, it's hard to believe, but the U.S. government spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year subsidizing fossil fuel production. We give, for example, uh, accelerated depreciation to oil companies when they invest in new oil wells. This is preposterous. And then, so first of all, the government needs to stop adding to the problem, but then they also need to do something to uh, force fossil fuel companies to get with the program. And one suggestion is for every ton of carbon that's in the fuel sold by a fossil fuel company, it has to remove a ton of carbon using carbon dioxide removal. Now, there, there are a couple of problems here. One is we don't have carbon dioxide removal yet. And the other is the government's not about to do that because the government is very much uh, in the pocket of the current energy system. So, what we really have to do is get ourselves a government that cares about this. And that means getting quite political and defeating senators and congressmen who are not trying to do something about climate change and replacing them with people who will do something. Sorry, that's a long, but the logic is the fossil fuel companies could do it themselves. They're not doing it. The government's going to have to make them do it. The government we have isn't going to do that. So we need a better government. To get the better government, we need political action. We need people to get out there, campaign, run for office, expose what's going on, write position papers, the works, get going politically. Well, but to push back on that point, though, several people have asked in the chat, this is a global problem and we don't have a global governance system. So to what extent would it even be effective to, you know, transform the U.S. government uh, into one that would act more aggressively when it's a global problem? Well, it's not enough. We, we need to get others, too. Luckily, the EU is on board. And in fact, uh, the EU has on the whole done more than the US. So that's one other set of countries who are, uh, who are actually trying to deal with climate change. One of the things the EU is doing is setting up a, a border adjustment tax so that if... Uh, products are being imported that have been manufactured in a way that generates more fossil fuel than those products would have generated if they had been made in the EU, then there will be an import tax. And the purpose of that is to try to force other uh, countries to impose carbon taxes or uh, uh, carbon trading or some kind of price on uh, their own carbon emissions. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, and then you can do you can do the usual international stuff. As I said, I, we've sold amazing numbers of fighter planes to the Saudis. We could uh, say you're not gonna get spare parts unless you uh, 
stop obstructing the negotiations. The Saudis in particular have been obstructionists the whole time. I mean, it's not surprising. Their wealth comes from fossil fuel. Uh, the Russians, happily, uh, from this point of view, are shooting themselves in the foot at the moment and destroying their best market. So uh, they're actually helping with the energy transition in, in Europe. China is, of course, the biggest emitter and needs to do the most. Uh, I, I don't have a good uh, proposal about what to do about China, but I, I agree with the people who say it's not enough for us to clean up our own act. Although I do think cleaning up our own act is one way of putting pressure on them, particularly if meanwhile, the EU and, and others are doing something. Um, I'm not, I don't have uh, a, uh, a strategy uh, to deal with all these things. China's a big problem, but the solution certainly is not for us not to do anything. And India, India is a nice case because they could soon become as much of a problem as China is now, but there's some hope that uh, they're going to take a different route. And in the case, well, in both cases, China and India, one thing we can do is make investments in, uh, in alternative technology. Uh, and we, we are doing that pretty heavily with, with India. I want to zoom back from the large global international view to something much more local and personal. A few people have asked questions about um, persuading skeptics, deniers of the science. Certainly, climate denial has mostly gone away from the level of the CEOs of oil companies and leaders of governments, but it has not disappeared on sort of the, the grassroots level. People still question the science. Lots of people who don't believe in the possibility of a transition away from fossil fuels, um, whether it's doubt about new technologies or not a lack of belief in the that the political will even exists. Do you have any advice on someone who is committed to creating change, how they persuade people in their orbit who don't believe it's necessary or don't believe it's possible? I have kind of two level answer to that. One is from being an old political uh, campaigner. We, we were always told when you knock on the door, if the people say they agree with you, you say, thanks, be sure to vote. If they say you're wrong and they want to argue with you, then you say, it's a free country, thanks for your time, and you move on because um, you're very unlikely to change the mind of, of people who are dug in. So I think the, the least effective thing to do is to argue with people who are entrenched, um, just in general. <laughs> Specifically on climate change, there's quite a bit of research that suggests that it isn't really the science that people are worried about. Um, for a start, most people haven't bothered to actually look at it and uh, and so haven't really tried to understand it. Uh, and But the main motivation seems to be the worry that in order to deal with climate change, we'll need more government. And so people who want the smallest possible government worry that in order to deal with climate change, the government will have to be, uh, will have to have power to do things like force uh, fossil fuel companies to change their strategy. And that's why I've been talking so much about the, the clear unwillingness of the fossil fuel companies to act on their own. I don't want to have a big powerful government. I would much prefer if the fossil fuel companies themselves would transform themselves in precisely the way they say they are. But since they aren't, uh, we need to bring pressure on them and that takes government action. Uh, this doesn't mean, you know, we have to have socialism, we have to have the government running everything, but it does mean that we need government action 
on uh, climate change. And I think one of the real tragedies is that uh, climate change has gotten turned into a Democrat versus Republican uh, battle, which is really ridiculous. I mean, the who was the president who did the most for the environment? Teddy Roosevelt, not a Democrat. Who signed the bill that established the Environmental Protection Agency? Richard Nixon not a Democrat. I mean, this caring for the environment and conserving things is is a Republican value. And there's nothing more conservative than not undermining the climate of the planet. So this really shouldn't be um, Democrats versus Republicans. But I think it's getting... It, Partly it's getting sucked into a more active government versus less active government struggle. And unfortunately, be, because of the fossil fuel interests won't act on their own, I think we do need more, more government action on, on this point, which doesn't mean we need more government in general. So that's what I, th I mean, I don't think arguing with people about this, I'm happy to argue with people about the science. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's been amazing uh, how much uh, terrific science has been done in the last quarter of a century. It's, it's delightful to talk about actually, but I don't really think that's the problem. Um, if it's not a, persuasion campaign that needs to happen, then what are the levers of power that individual people who are here in this conversation, what are the tools that people have in order to try to change the outcome? Well, basically political action. Uh, I already talked about campaigning, running for office. I think uh, a march on Washington this spring uh, would be a good thing. You know, here in England, there was a group or is a group called Extinction Rebellion, which was engaging in disruptive tactics like blocking uh, intersections in uh, highways or blocking uh, subways when people are trying to get to work. They've just announced that that was backfiring. They're dropping it. What they're gonna do is organize a march on parliament for the spring, I think. Uh, if some college students would like to organize a march on Washington, uh, that would be a good idea, too. I mean, I think we, we need to let uh, our leaders know that we need more serious action from them. This is a, it's not an easy issue. We, we, we had the Inflation Reduction Act last year which actually did do some good things. And there are, I keep talking about defeating the incumbents because I don't have much, much hope for a lot of them. But the other view is, well, they did pass the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's the other possibility. You, you can uh, demonstrate, try to change the incumbents or you can try to persuade the incumbents. If you can persuade them, that's fine uh, and put pressure on them. But there are, as a lot of people know, there are serious weaknesses in the Inflation Reduction Act. And the, the main one is it's all carrots. There's lots of subsidies for renewables and for electric cars and charging stations and people uh, to put solar panels on their houses. And that's all good. But what drives the climate change is the accumulation of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can put in millions of solar panels. If you don't reduce the fossil fuel use, you're not slowing climate change. Now, the one hope is if we get enough alternative energy, and the price goes down, which it has already. I mean, one of the really helpful things is the collapse in the price of solar and wind. 
Uh, so they're not, the solar in particular is now cheaper than any kind of fossil fuel. The hope is if, if you get enough of this, then people will choose the non-fossil fuel and the, and the uh, demand for the fossil fuels will go down. But simply waiting on this to happen via the market means it's going to take quite a long time, I fear, and I don't think it's going to happen uh, fast enough. So we, we do need the alternatives and we need to get them cheaper, but we really need uh, to uh, pressure fossil fuel production to get it to slow down, starting with not increasing production. Right now, uh, companies are drilling new oil wells, oil wells, new gas wells. We've that's really got to stop. Uh, so whether, sorry, that was a somewhat rambling thing, but I, the political judgments here are hard. Maybe we can work with the incumbents. I'm afraid that too many of the incumbents are really dependent on campaign contributions from the energy interests that we have now and that that's not going to get us there. If it will, great. It means we need to see a lot more legislation coming out of Congress very quickly. If that's not happening, then I think we need uh, to replace people. That's not going to happen very fast either. I mean, these are these things are hard, but uh, we have to do one of them. You've been theorizing in this space for 30 years now. What's changed since you started working on it? Oh, all sorts of things. I, as I mentioned, the science now has just advanced remarkably, and we have far, far better grip on a lot of these things. Um, the fossil fuel companies have stopped denying and started pretending to be on our side. That's a big change. Climate change has arrived. I mean, you know, in 1990, it wasn't absolutely clear that there was really going to be any climate change or any climate change to speak of. It's here. Last year at the COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, the big issue was loss and damage, which is whether rich countries should uh, help the poor countries deal with the damage done. That's an issue because of damage has now been done. Back in 1990, the damage hadn't been done. So we knew a lot less. So I suppose you could say that much in our defense, uh, but, uh, but we knew enough to know that the cautious path and, and the path that would uh, be least likely to, to uh, hurt other people would be to get get started and and we didn't really uh get started so now we know a lot more unfortunately and a lot of what we know is that things are getting bad and they're getting bad uh pretty quickly uh one i mean another thing that's happened that there are too many things to talk about but one really good thing is this drop in the price of uh renewables which i mentioned the other really good thing is is activism among young people. I mean, the Greta Thunbergs of the world uh, who are really getting mobilized now are uh, one of the, that's a huge change. I mean, there was nothing remotely like uh, Greta Thunberg and, and widespread uh, social movement among young people in those days. And that's in many ways, the most hopeful thing that we have now. Yeah. If I, I think there might be a couple other things as you were talking, I was just, you know, thinking about recent shifts in the conversation about climate change. I think there's a lot more sophisticated understanding of the ways in which climate change intersects with racism and with sexism around the world and the disparate impacts of, of people. That's something that you now see acknowledged on the international stage in negotiations about climate change in a way that I'm not sure it was all along. Yeah, that is true. Uh, environmental justice was barely mentioned. I mean, there were 
activists and they're, they've been environmental justice activists for, there are people who've been doing that for longer than I've been worrying about the international stuff, but, but it was not uh, widely known. But we've gotten much clearer on the extent to which, for example, women in poor countries bear burdens caused by uh, climate change and gathering water or, yeah. right being the ones who have to gather the water and as the drought gets worse having to go farther and farther for the for the water and here i mean because i'm living in england it's i'm not uh, as sharply aware, aware of some of these things but i get the impression that there's quite a bit more attention to the health damage from the um plastics firms the uh uh in say louisiana cancer alley in louisiana and uh and also to the just general sighting of uh polluting things near uh the sections of town that have uh black and and other disadvantaged mm -hmm. uh people in them yeah. um and indigenous people, I mean, part, partly because it, it's a lot of the fighting against unnecessary ga gas pipelines and oil pipelines uh, has been done by indigenous people. Uh, they're getting much more uh, visible, although there's a real movement now uh, to make these demonstrations illegal. There's, a, there's something called... Uh, uh, American Legislative Executive Council, ALEC, A-L-E-C, and they uh, produce what they consider to be model legislation. And some of the model legislation that they've come up with uh, makes it a crime uh, to get in the way of the construction of infrastructure, uh, which means uh, demonstrating against a, an oil pipeline. Uh, so, uh, as always happens in politics, of course, you get you get social movements growing. You then get the opposition to them growing, but then that just means you have to fight harder. Yeah, and you know my my beat, what I cover, cars and energy means I I have kind of a front row seat on where this transition is and isn't happening, including things like the auto the auto industry is truly spending trillions of dollars to actually build electric vehicles. Um, but as you know, the the oil industry projects that demand is not going away, and they fully intend to to drill to meet that demand. All the cars that are on the road now, unless some very creative political action is taken, they will continue to be on the road for a very long time. Um, I'm going to ask you for the last question, a question that our uh, collective group here has decided needs to be the last question for this <laughs> conversation. Given the scale of the challenge, given the urgency of what you have laid out that needs to happen and the fact that the world has not managed to bring anything commensurate to the problem to the table thus far. Henry, how what, what gives you hope? How do you stay optimistic instead of pessimistic as you call for the world to actually take action? Well, the thing that gives me the most hope actually is the youth movement. I really, I, you know, I know that I have a limited number of years uh, left to fight this battle. And so it's really important to see that there are young people who are taking it up and, and in many ways uh, conducting it much better than, uh, than my age group ever did um we can see that we can make a difference i mean in a way the bad stuff that's happened actually confirms the science i mean we were told in 1990 if you don't do certain things the west antarctic sheet may start melting we may start getting much worse storms we may start getting um uh, bigger forest fires it's all happening that's bad but it is evidence that the science is right. And so since when we didn't do what we needed to do, the bad things happened, there's good solid ground for thinking that if we do do the right thing, uh, we can make good things happen. I, we have a fight on our hands. There's no guarantee we'll win. 
it's it's a real battle and there are serious people on the other side who are in their wealth depends on things not changing um so it's a fight uh i i find that galvanizing it makes me uh when i see that a relatively few people's greed is uh maintaining practices that are undermining the climate for everybody in the world and for future generations uh, it just makes me angry and makes me want to fight more so uh i recommend being as hopeful as you can and i also recommend getting angry and uh and uh going after some of this stuff and do you think ultimately it's a few people not that the bulk of humanity is self-interested and would rather serve their own needs and screw the future. No, I think most most people are decent and and will respond. I'm I'm really talking about the people who have vested interests in the energy system that we have now. Um, you know, all of us are complicated. We're all somewhat selfish, but most people have some empathy for others. And that empathy, I think, can be aroused. I mean, this is one reason I talk so much about future generations. I, I think people have natural empathy for the people they see. And one of the things we need to do is help them be imaginative about the people they don't see, the people in the future uh, who are depending on them. And I think a lot of people will, will respond. Uh, some are responding because they've been hoodwinked. I mean, they believe the the propaganda. Other people, you know, have busy lives, don't know about the problem. So uh, we need to inform them. So it's, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> there's There's a lot of selfishness. There's a lot of empathy. There's a lot of generosity and courage. Uh, we're all mixed bags. So uh, all we can do is draw on the on the what virtues people have and try to to fight back against the vices a radical call to empathy as our as our call to right. arms here henry thank you so much for this really wonderful conversation thank you everybody we had some excellent questions in the chat and i know we did not have time here to to get to all of them um but i really appreciate everyone putting them in and having conversations back and forth as well. Uh, Henry has offered to follow up on questions and comments that we weren't able to get to in the chat, which is wonderful since there were so many excellent questions that came up. Uh, Davidson staff members are going to share the contact information. So if you want to reach out to him individually, uh, you'll be able to do that. You'll have that opportunity. And watch your inboxes within the next week or so. There's also going to be a follow-up email that's going to go out with contact information, some action steps, um, I think specifically for Davidson Generations group that is being established. Uh, there's going to be a brief survey, the bibliography with extra resources that Henry mentioned, and more information on the other programs that are coming up in this series. So Thank you again to everybody for coming and spending a little a little time here. I think Henry mentioned the the power of experiencing other people, right? Knowing that this is not something that any of us are thinking about or talking through alone. So I am grateful for all of you. I also love that some of you had your cameras on because it is really great in these Zooms to get to know that there are people on the other side. So um, if you had your camera on, know that I was looking into your eyes and I appreciate you very much. So thank you so much. And I heard my future generations calling from downstairs. So I do think we're going to have to, we're all going to have to bounce off and go our separate ways. I want to give Henry the last word uh, since he is the, the star of the show here. So Henry, take it Oh, away. well, just if I've said something you think is nuts, uh, let me know. And I might be able to give you some uh, references to something that, that would back it up. Or if I can't, I'll, I'll admit it and you'll realize that I, to have learned something. Uh, get in there and uh, and be active. Uh, we need everybody we can get. Awesome. And thanks, Dane. Thank Dane just dropped the, the link to Davidson Generations there in the chat. 
Have a good one, everybody. We need going off music. We need some kind of <laughs> farewell sound. We just, I'm sorry, you can't make the dinner. We just booked a, a student fiddle player to play everyone into the dinner. So nice. Stick at that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm.